Hello and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. Today we've got a special spotlight episode on self-hosting. As usual, I'm joined with Phil. Hey, Phil. Hey, how's it going? And I've also got Alex again from the Self-Hosted Podcast. Welcome back, Alex. Hello. Good evening. Good morning. I'm not entirely sure what time of day it is with you two, but hi. That's right. That's right. <laughs> with us, it's both usually. So. This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nebukasa. Easily and securely access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that also supports the Home Assistant project. Configuration is via the user interface, so no fiddling with router settings. SSL certificates or any YAML. So, as our first uh, spotlight episode of 2020, um, let's 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 dig a little bit into self-hosting and what you're doing at home in terms of self-hosting and some of the stuff you've done, and then and then we can kind of go into dive a little bit deeper on on how others uh, others can uh, go about it. Well, I think first of all, self-hosting started for me largely out of being a cheap ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to pay five bucks for a DigitalOcean droplet instead of five bucks per service or whatever from different people. You know, I wanted to host my own blog, for example. Yeah. And then I wanted to store some files. So I thought I'd do Nextcloud. And then I wanted to graph stuff like the ping time that my ISP was running for me. Yeah. And over time, it sort of snowballed in, into different things, you know, IRC bouncers and monitoring all the different parameters of my Linux servers in my house and that kind of thing. And and over time, you end up building this very complex house of cards where you have, it starts off as three or four different services, and then it's a yeah. dozen, and before you know it, it's 20 or 30 different services running on a single box or two. Some are in the cloud, some are local. But the primary thing about self-hosting it, that makes it great is that it's under your control. There is no business model at play. There is mm-hmm. no kind of insidious data siphoning it's just you and the command line and if if you can make the thing work it will keep working pretty much until the end of time right right so now i mean for you in the sense that just just to kind of iterate on a little more you're not you're not you're you are a little bit concerned about data mining or or what have you with your data or or just trying to avoid it in general well i didn't used to be yeah but if we wind the clock back a bit one of the um, first projects that got me into open source was linuxserver.io. Yep. I helped co-found that with a couple of guys in 2013 or 14, I forget. Uh, it was my personal blog anyway, which ironically was the first service I ever self-hosted. I was paying for a WordPress instance, and I thought a great way to give back to the community that had helped me so much learn how to get into Linux was to write down what I was doing, mainly so that I didn't keep having to Google what I'd just done the next time I needed to do it in a couple of weeks. Eventually I got tired of the WordPress plugins and the bloat and that kind of thing. And then ghost blogging came along. So I started running that in a container, but around about the same sort of time, uh, we were starting Linux server and um, things like Quasal. We dockerized that. We also put smoke ping into a container. There were several others as well. Plex was one of them. Um, So, you know, after you start getting three or four containers together, you start thinking, well, why don't we have a common base image? And and there's a bunch of stuff here that is, you know, if you're familiar with Docker, it's yeah. second nature. But but there comes with self-hosting multiple services, a quote-unquote economy of scale. You put a okay. bunch of time in up front of learning these different things, concepts like Docker, like um, how to write a Docker Compose file, for example. And then every time you want to add a new service, it's a case of adding five or six lines to a file, then you're done. You know, I can totally appreciate that. I think even uh, when I started with Grocy, which is the um, grocery management system for your home, there's now a, I, I think I first started with the Linux server IO Docker container for it. Like there is just basically a Docker container for everything f- from you guys. So, and once again, you just push a couple of lines of code up and, and it's up and running, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now this past year, I got more and more into podcasting. So I've actually stepped back from the Linux server team now, mm. but it was, um, but they do a really great job. Honestly, they have, I don't even know how many containers, honestly, must be pushing a hundred or so. Wow. If you go to fleet.linuxserver.io, you'll actually see a whole bunch of stuff in there. Very cool. I actually discover a lot of my apps that way nowadays. So if I'm not, if I'm not sure how to do something, there's a few different ways. So there's the awesome self-hosted list on GitHub, which is a really, truly fantastic resource. Now, this thing is a GitHub page, markdown page, and it's just mm. a bunch of links, which sounds right. 
I'm not really selling it very well, but honestly, go look at it. Uh, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. Yeah, this sounds similar to the awesome home assistant uh, list that we've got as well. Well, yes, these these awesome lists have kind of there is an awesome awesome list. Which gets a bit <laughs> messed because that's just a list of different awesome lists. Okay. <laughs> Self hosting is one of them. Home Assistant is one of them. There's a bunch of others as well. Right, that's funny. That is that is very cool. I, I didn't know about the awesome awesome list, but gotta check that out now. But let me flip the question back around to you both. Okay, what do you think's you know the most important thing about self hosting? Ooh, that's a good question. Why why do you do it then? Okay, for me, it's more control. I don't like the the thought of a company changing a product that I'm using today. Even when it comes to, like, for example, Microsoft Word and they've got their 365 subscription and the apps are constantly updating, I don't like that I have no control over when apps are updating and what features and functionality is being added, but also removed. And I think that's important, especially in the home automation space. But, you know, I don't want to log in tomorrow and find out that, oh, that Dropbox feature is gone because they've changed their pricing model all of a sudden. Well, how about this for an example? Um, one of the new self-hosting apps that I've recently discovered is one called LibreSpeed. And this is a self-hosted speed test app. That doesn't Mm -hmm. sound like it's terribly important, except for the fact that a lot of ISPs are lying SOBs, you know? They will significantly prioritize traffic to speedtest.net. Really? Because they know if someone does a speed test and it doesn't show the speed they're paying for, they're going to get a phone call. Yeah, so I know, I know, I'm not going to name any ISPs, uh, but I know for a fact that there are several Canadian ISPs that do do that. That's very interesting, and and it and it's interesting. So, so personally, I don't I don't actually use speedtest.net for that exact reason um, because of the acceleration and stuff. But uh, yeah, that's that's uh, so so interesting. So so you run your own uh, speed test in a container as well, then? Yes. Uh, the reason for it actually was um, I just moved into a new house yeah. and I was running a bunch of Ethernet and I wanted to check the speed of the cable that I'd just run. So I thought, well, the easiest, I mean, I could do like an iPerf thing. I could yeah. get onto the command line, but mm-hmm. it would be much easier if I could just pull out my phone and go to a browser page and just run a speed test from the server in my basement. Or I could then run one on DigitalOcean as well and check my throughput, my ingress and egress from, you know, the PF sense yeah, box I have. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So, I mean, and and I, I kind of I don't want to avoid your question either. So, for me, self hosting, um, why it's important is honestly because more because I am worried about services dying, right? Hosted services dying. So, um, as an example, I mean, we've had Logitech kill some stuff. We've had Nest kill stuff. We've had wh- whoever it is, right? Now, that's not to say that I don't. I'm a hundred percent self hosted. I'm absolutely not. I'm. Mm-hmm. But whatever I can self-host, there are some things that I actually like that aren't self-hosted. For example, my Lutron switches. That does talk up to the cloud. There's some local control there, but for the most part, it still talks up to the cloud, whatever. They can still brick the box. But for me, that's that's a big thing, though, um, especially around my automations, around a lot of that stuff. There, there's there's quite a bit of effort that I've put into that that I don't want to redo, uh, which is actually... Uh, Outside of not wanting to learn Groovy, that was actually one of the big things that moved me off of s- smart things onto Home Assistant. Because for me, YAML was just a lot more logical. Uh, and th- now we don't really need YAML. We still need YAML a little bit here and there. But uh, but this is, I mean, way back when. It was a, it was a much easier thing for me to learn. And, and it helped with, again, even it was standardized across Docker and so on and so forth. Where um, So it was actually worth my time to sit down and figure it out. I think I figured it out in like 20 minutes. It's not difficult, but... Do you think, Alex, that if to compare to compare smart things like from Samsung and Home Assistant, Home Assistant is a self-hosted version of a home automation controller, whereas Samsung smart things generally, and maybe not today, but used to require a lot of cloud connection and, and a lot of logic to be processed on their servers as opposed to in your home? That's a really interesting question. Since we started the self-hosted podcast, I think there's been a lot of people giving us feedback that self-hosting is great because it's anti-cloud and the cloud is bad. Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily true because all you're doing when you have something in the cloud, you know, a cloud service like Google Drive or a smart things integration or whatever it might be, you're trading your time, you're trading your expertise for that service or you're trading your data for that service. You you pay Mm. for it one way or another, whether that's in your time to learn how to 
use Docker or to write a bash script or to learn Linux or whatever it is. Yeah. Or you pay for it by giving away your metadata, which if you've listened to any Edward Snowden book is rather alarming. Mm. Um, yeah. And so I think the answer to your question is, uh, it depends on your personal set of values, right? And for me, I would much rather buy something physically that I could flash and put TAS motor on and it will mm-hmm. keep working until the hardware physically fails, yeah. which in this age of mindless consumerism, I think is something we should all try and do. Now I'm surrounded by a 3D printer and all sorts of other useless junk that's a lot of fun, but is it's it's all oil based products, it's all plastic stuff, and it's all contributing mm. to this global kind of I feel guilty about it. Sure. But it's fun at the same time and I get a lot of pleasure out of it. And I think a lot of people fall into that kind of category. And I think if I can take some small steps, admittedly, you know, buy a Shelly instead of buy a Lutron switch. Because yeah. much as you might love Lutron Who's to say in 10 years they don't go out of business or absolutely they don't get DDoSed and you can't turn your lights on and off? I mean, yeah. I'm not familiar with Lutron. I think it's like, is it, there's like a local API as well? There is. Um, there's like a cloud it, backup. It, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, hidden and there's not, it's not, I don't think it's a proper official API. But uh, yeah, there, there, there is something. But yeah, but honestly, that, that's something that gives me a bit of anxiety as well, right? Is, you know, tomorrow if they turn this off, we just heard about Sonos. Um, yes, wanting to. It's all okay now, though. They've gone. They've backtracked. Yeah, I, I, I saw. We're something really about sorry. That. We listen. Yeah, mm. yeah. Hey, you know what? Great. Don't turn it off. <laughs> right? yeah. that's, that's the. I think. I think that's the key out of uh, out of a lot of that. But 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 that's the thing, right? It's great. You invest. You know, whether it's five dollars or five thousand dollars into something. Mm-hmm. Right. And you expect to be able to use that for a little bit. And then tomorrow they turn around and say, hey, sorry, too bad. Right. And that to me, I have a problem. I have a bit of a problem with that um, as much as I still end up utilizing things that do have that. I, I still as yeah. personally from a values perspective, I, I have an issue with that. Right. So but but I do also understand that they can't keep hosting something for five people that run it now. Right. So th- there's, again, there's, there's mixed. Uh... Well, it's less about that. I think it's, it's more about the business model of constant growth, mm, which sure. is what our economy is based on, yep. you know? And if, if I'm not buying a new fridge every 10 years, it used to be fridges lasted for 20, 30 years. And now mm-hmm. the average lifespan of a fridge is seven years. I mean, it's just, wow. that's outrageous, isn't it? That, that in this age of composite materials and, we're getting a bit philosophical here, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in this age of composite materials and computer-aided design and all these kind of fancy, amazing things that we can do. Yeah. We can, we can, SpaceX can land two rockets at the same time and reuse them next month. You know, it's, it's amazing what we can do, but it's also incredible what forces the market can apply to certain business models. And right. when you apply that to software and self-hosting stuff nobody's going to make any money out of me if i'm self-hosting my own blog except for DigitalOcean, maybe they make five bucks a month whatever but right. um, it's not a sustainable business model for a lot of other people but i think it's more sustainable from a self-sustainability point of view in that i'm not reliant on other people to do things for me and if i was to ever start a business around any of this stuff i could leverage a lot of my expertise and build a lot of that infrastructure myself I don't know where my, what my point is here, but it's that self-hosting is good. Cloud is also kind of good, so yeah. long as you understand the trade-offs you're making. Yeah. So if someone wants to self-host today and, you know, they want to start moving some of their cloud subscriptions back into the home or into their own infrastructure, does someone need, you know, like a huge server farm NSA level running in their basement or can they just do it with a Raspberry Pi? Like what, what sort of hardware does someone need? Oh, well, you mentioned the Raspberry Pi word. I think you should get a, you know, a ding, ding, ding. There should be a bell or something <laughs> for that. I'd say it's probably the most common way for people to get started simply because a lot of us bought a Raspberry Pi over the years thinking, oh, I'm going to learn electronics or I'm going to do this, that and the other with it. And it just yeah. sits in a drawer for six months. And then eventually you think, right. I'm going to do something with a Raspberry Pi. And then you put Raspbian on it and run, I don't know, Nextcloud or some 
something right. or home assistant i suppose that's relevant to this audience right fundamentally though no you don't need a server farm i mean that would be nice but you can self-host with pretty much anything from as we've just said a raspberry pi right the way up to the new mac pro if you're made of money yeah i've run a few different systems over the years so i've gone from atom based very low power systems nux i've used a couple of those uh, right now i've got a pair of dual xeons in my basement they are very power hungry so they they idle at about 300 watts which yeah. is approximately a dollar per year per watt so oh, wow. roughly roughly it cost me 300 dollars a year just to have it switched on mm. and once it starts doing plex trans codes and stuff like that it jumps up to four or five hundred watts pretty quickly but they are beastly cpus and they've there's like 20 cores and stuff down there right and so if i was a you know if there was a convention out there for self-hosting and, and i'm running a you know like a a consumer grade product i think you know for example synology have the concept of my cloud and ds file they've got you know western digital have their own nas would i be laughed at thinking oh yep. you're just you know an amateur using you know software to do it for you or is that a viable alternative if people are running you know consumer grade nasas that offer these self-hosting cloud products i think looking back over the last five to ten years or so i've used at one time or another one of all of these different platforms you just mentioned for some period of mm. time yeah now ultimately i'm quite a big nerd and so I ended up finding the limitations of the Synology platform pretty quickly, mostly because they ship with like 500 megs of RAM or something. Yeah. 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 And so by the time you want to run Plex and then you want to sync your files with BitTorrent Sync and then do the next cloud thing, you're out of RAM three services ago. Yeah. So very quickly, I ended up moving towards the Unraid community and recycling some old hardware in my cupboard. So yeah, I found I found the Unraid community unbelievably cool, and great and helpful and really gave me a leg up to understanding how to do a lot of this stuff. And the only prerequisite to enter that community is that you're running some kind of x86 hardware. So that's something that can boot off a USB key. Now, a lot of the devices you've just mentioned are ARM-based devices. Raspberry Pi, of course, is ARM-based. A lot of the Synology stuff used to be ARM-based. Some of the cheaper stuff still is. Yeah. Some of their newer stuff is now x86-based. And so for those that aren't haven't made the link yet, x86 is the same architecture that Intel and AMD use in your desktop system, your laptop, whatever. And ARM is the same architecture that, you know, Apple and Google or whoever use in your phone. Mm. There's a bit more to it than that. But broadly speaking, that's what we're talking about. Right. And not every application is compiled for those different architectures. So what you might find is that certain applications are available for Intel x86 platforms, sorry, and they're not available for ARM platforms. Now, one of the things that I think is really cool that the Linux server team do is they compile their containers for pretty much every platform that the upstream app supports. So Very cool. Yeah, there's been a lot of cool work done by Docker to support multi-platform mm. builds and um some of very smart guys on that on on the Linux server team have put a lot of time into that. Not me, yeah. but you know, they they they've done a great job with some of that stuff. Uh, so to answer your question Phil, no, I don't think there's certainly no judgment from me if you're running a Synology versus running you know, a home lab, multi-array ESXi server with clustering and live migrations, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think the main thing that I look for when, I don't mean to say judging people, but we all do <laughs> when they ask for help or, you know, the, I get a lot of PMs on Telegram from the Jupiter Broadcasting side of things saying, mm. I need help with this, I need help with that. And it's quite clear the people who are interested in it to learn and be inquisitive and figure out how they can better themselves maybe or they just want to save some money and they're less interested, but they're more motivated by finance. And there's all sorts of different reasons right. why people get into self-hosting. And it's not my place to say who's right or wrong, really. But I think ultimately what matters is that they're interested and we can just, as a community, get together and help them figure out some stuff. Yeah, no, I think I agree with that. So so how can someone who isn't, I mean, we, we threw a lot of uh, words around, so... It, how can someone who's not an expert in, let's say, Linux or building their own machines or something like that, how can they kind of get started for to self-host? Or, or what, what is, what's some low-hanging fruit? It's unfortunate because it, these sorts of answers often come down to money. Sure. And 
you know, you can buy a lot of really good off the shelf stuff. You know, IX systems make the free NAS mini. So if you want to go down the ZFS route and figure out, I think they've added Docker recently to FreeNAS. Mm-hmm. You could do that. You could buy a pre-built system off of eBay. Yeah. You know, some old enterprise system like what I did. There's a really great resource at serverbuilds.net, which is all about used enterprise gear. Now, there are yeah. some yeah. debates cropping up lately about whether used enterprise gear is actually cheaper in the long run when you factor in the power bill. As I just said, my old enterprise gear is quite pricey mm. on that side. Yeah. Yeah. But some great resources, I think. I mean, the self hosted podcast, uh, plug, plug, plug. There you go. <laughs> the um, serverbills.net forum is good. Unraid is fantastic for new people. People like Wendell, believe it or not, even though he's super nerdy on level one techs, he has some nuggets in there of some really useful stuff as well. And my general advice would be find some YouTubers that are, you know, in the space that you're interested in, like Home Assistant, for example, Dr. Mm-hmm. Z's. He's a great example because yep. if you look at some of his older videos, he gets super excited about learning about Proxmox and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, I remember that, you know, and, yeah. you know, now he has that knowledge to pass on to other people as well. And I think particularly as Home Assistant is like a gateway drug for a lot of people, it's right. I need to have this thing running in my house all the time. Okay never done that before how do i how do i go about doing this in a reliable fashion now the other thing i would say to new people is be prepared to fail a bit you know this journey i've been on for 10 years and (laughs) my wife actually did an interview for um there's a jupiter broadcasting podcast series called brunch with brent Mm -hmm. um okay with with a buddy of mine brent and he he interviewed my wife and one of the questions he asked her which i could kill him for was how reliable is Alex's home automations and do <laughs> oh, they no. do they make sense? And her answer was pretty diplomatic, actually. It was, well, it's always changing. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I thought that was actually quite a diplomatic answer because <laughs> they're changing because I'm learning how to make it better. You sure. know, a great example of this is solving the light switch problem. Now, you mm. all know in the home assistant world what I mean it's the no don't use the light switch just ask the lady cylinder in the corner to turn the lights off or get out this app and then tap this thing three times and turn west and (laughs) turn the lights off that way yeah so recently i bought a couple of these shelly 2.5 things and they're about the size of an oreo cookie and uh, they enable you to turn a light on and off from a switch doesn't sound revolutionary yet but you can flash tasmosa onto these things which means Mm. that you can control your light switch independently of the light itself, if that makes any sense. Right. Um, Which meant a whole bunch of stuff changed for my wife. And actually it improved it because over time I've sort of realized that when guests come to stay, they need to be able to turn the light switch on and off as well as I need the ability to automate that light switch. So it's just trying to cater to all the different use cases and, the reality of it is, is that you're not going to think of all the different ways in which stuff could break in the first six months. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Which when you're self-hosting, believe me, it will break and it will <laughs> always break at the most inopportune time. Mm-hmm. Yep, and of course it will. When you're in Yellowstone with no cell signal, for example, your server will go offline and <laughs> the, the one day that you get like half a bar of signal, you get 15 texts from your family going, why is Plex offline? Yeah. <laughs> Because I'm on holiday, that's why. <laughs> you, you know what? It's 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 funny because no matter what, like at, at home, I barely touch a home assistant, like unless I actually have to, like do mm-hmm. any upgrades or anything like that. I'll do upgrades uh, when the uh, when the RCs come out or when the when the beta comes out, and you know whatever, fine. But then, but when I anytime I travel, without fail, some service somewhere on in home assistant will crash, and then that means my lights won't turn on at certain times or you know, <laughs> and, and whatever it is, just, it's always what I travel. Whenever I'm home, it's perfectly fine. No issue. Yep. So. They have a built-in anxiety sensor computers. <laughs> yeah, I swear that's it. right. <laughs> I know, I know. Now, there's a so, couple of other things I'd like to espouse people at least consider when they're getting into this stuff. One is sharing. Mm-hmm. So I talked a little bit about how my blog led into Linux server and ultimately led to my job at Red Hat and the self-hosted podcast and every, everything that is my life right now, I think, ultimately started through that silly little blog that i was writing yeah you know how did i compile a kernel well lots of other people have written how to do it but i wrote it down in my language and then Mm. lots of other people found that useful and 
maybe blogging isn't the way for everybody, but I found it great. Now, the, the other thing is to commit everything to source control. So that would be Git, probably GitHub. Sure. It sounds really overkill, except for when it isn't. Now, don't publish a password in clear text like I did last week. So I had to reset my Google password, which was really annoying. Oh, no. Uh, um, but there are lots of really great ways to interface with GitHub now. And for those that don't know what Git is, it's uh, it's a way to store source code, which is really just plain text. Yeah. And luckily for you, a lot of your Home Assistant configuration files are just plain text YAML files. And so they will interface with github just fine you might need to figure out ssh keys and that kind of thing but that's a bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about here but there are a lot of plugins for things like vs code which is built right into a home assistant add-on which will let you commit all of your home assistant stuff to github in a private repo where nobody except you can see it unless they get hacked but let's not talk (laughs) about that (laughs) and then you know if for any reason your home assistant server gets you know stolen or there's a flood or you just simply screw something up yeah you have a version controlled history of every change you've ever made to that file and i can't tell you how many times just saving my samba config for example for sharing files into a single file has saved my bacon yes i really recommend people don't get put off by the fact it's a developer tool and just try it out it is yeah. the ultimate control Z if you do something wrong. There is your history of yeah. every point in time. It can bite you in the ass too because, you know, in the commercial world, I've had Git blamed on a few times on me and mm. there's no hiding from that. Yeah, there's mm. no hiding from that. Yeah. So, Alex, I would like to ask your opinion then. So, you just mentioned before that you published your Google password up to GitHub. What is your decision on whether to self-host a service, for example, why haven't you decided to self-host a Git server somewhere as opposed to using GitHub? Great question. I actually do host a Git server. I have one on my LAN, which is mm-hmm. Git T. It's spelled G I T E A. So Git Gitea. Oh, yeah, like a cup of tea. Git yeah. I, I don't. Right. I don't know. But the reality is that that one, because it contains a lot of unreleased stuff, a lot of kind of code, I would rather never saw the light of day because it's just complete <laughs> hacks. Yeah. That lives in there and it there isn't there isn't a public record for that. It it only exists in my local firewall, so it resolves when I'm on my LAN or on my VPN, but it doesn't resolve if I'm on the public internet. Right. Then when I'm ready to quote unquote pub- publish something, I will send it to GitHub. And the reason that often gets overlooked for self-hosting versus using the commercial cloud alternative is the network effect. And it's never more strong than with something like GitHub. It's where everything is, you know. Yes, there are some people on GitLab. Yes, there are a few people on SourceForge. But 99.9% of the projects are on yeah. GitHub. Mm-hmm. And it means if I open an issue against Home Assistant, I can use my existing account. I can then go and open another issue against something else and use my account. And it, they all sure. link together. And then I can reference them all from one other place and say it's a duplicate and it's just great and everybody you begin to recognize usernames and it's yeah. just that community network effect yeah yeah no github's definitely very cool um it's funny i used to i used to actually run gitlab at home and then uh just mostly just for home assistant config backups and and a couple other just little uh shell scripts and stuff that i was writing and uh and then it got corrupt and i was like well looks like i'm moving <laughs> i actually moved to bitbucket at the time cuz uh github didn't have uh free private repos at that time so Running an entire GitLab at home is a bit like building a warehouse to store one box in. Yep. I learned that one after I did it. <laughs> Just complete overkill. <laughs> yes, <laughs> quite. <laughs> it's great. Don't get me wrong. Like I've, I've used GitLab at a, one of my previous jobs and a lot of their inbuilt CI tooling is really good and that yeah, kind of cool. stuff. But to get back to Phil's question of how do I choose to self-host something or not, you just kind of develop a, a sense of at the end of the day of, as to whether you can be bothered to put the effort in to so- figure something out or not. And admittedly, Docker has made the barrier to entry a lot lower, but it's not zero. Mm, you yeah, know, I'll need true. to go and figure out my reverse proxy configurations for Nginx or traffic or whatever I'm using. I need to figure out what port number it's on. I need to en- add a DNS record. I need to do a bunch of different stuff, which yeah. a lot of it I have automated, but it still takes me probably half an hour to spin something up in this system. 
and sometimes I just can't be bothered and I'd rather pay the five bucks for the service. And then if I don't use it for more than a couple of months, no big deal. Yeah. How about for like hardware uh, things? So I know, I know you mentioned uh, the Shelly, for example, the Shelly 2.5. Do you have a ton of stuff that, uh, that you, that, that use cloud services or anything like that? Or do you primarily build most of them or flash most of them or uh, do something similar? So as I've said a few times, throughout this episode i've sort of been doing i've sort of been building up to this kind of home automation this yeah. house that we just bought a month ago i've sort of been building up to this for a year two three or four yeah and i've made a lot of mistakes in those two or three four years i will continue to make mistakes that's the beauty of being a nerd is there's just an <laughs> endless opportunity to make mistakes yeah. there's always a bug somewhere yeah exactly and, and now there's a bug in my home assistant configuration almost always my automation in node red or something isn't quite figured out that if my wife and i both come home at the same time the garage door is going to go oh, okay so i need to just rate limit that okay fine but the reality is that i've bought in the past i've bought a lot of products like the nest for example that are very tightly coupled to the cloud mm-hmm. as in if the cloud service goes offline they won't work right. now I, when i moved into this house I was looking pretty closely at the Ecobee thermostats. And then I found some Reddit posts where those thermostats went offline for a couple of days because the Ecobee cloud service went offline. Even though they have a local API, they wouldn't work. I think it's an unofficial API. They wouldn't work without the cloud server. And I'm like, no, I can't. That's just been down this road before. And it's trying to make sure that you apply the lessons you learn to each purchase decision. And so what I ended up doing was buying a Venstar T2000. And that has a local API in it. So it, it I could, you know, worst case scenario, write a bash script and just run curl against the thing. Right. And, want, you know, they, doc- they document their API on their website so I can figure it out that way. Luckily, there's a Home Assistant integration, so I can just use that instead. Nice. Which makes my life a lot easier. Now, they were they're not the prettiest things. But it's a thermostat. I don't really need it to look like an iPod, you know. So I think in general, it's just trying to figure out all the different ways in which you can be caught out when buying a specific product. Like when you're looking at different light bulbs, for example, if you buy into Philips Hue versus buying something that can run Tasmota versus buying a a different Wi-Fi bulb, like there's so many different considerations that need to go into different things. And if you can find something that runs Tasmota, like this Tekin SB50 light bulb that I'm showing you. This thing is an RGB light bulb. I think it was about $10. Okay. It can run Tasmota and therefore responds to MQTT commands. Nice. Until this light bulb physically fails, I'm going to keep using it. If Tekin decide that they want to change their business model, fine. I don't care. Yeah. Wi-Fi is not going anywhere. Whereas if Philips Hue decide that they want to change or retire the hub that I'm using for some reason, much like Sonos tried to this week, right? I need to go and buy 20 new light bulbs because suddenly the light bulbs that are still physically fine don't work with this hub anymore. That's and it's correct. Yeah. It's just so annoying when that stuff happens because you think, ah, oh, these, these things physically are fine. Like if you just give me a way to flash an open source firmware onto it, mm-hmm. and this is something actually Chris and I talked about in self-hosted episode 11 is what Sonoff should have done yep. is said we're going to give you the keys to the device you want to put an open source firmware on it go ahead right the new stuff will no longer work with it because you're going to basically customize it but we're mm-hmm. going to give you a version of this firmware that is completely open and unlocked and will support i don't know whatever their protocol is uh, and airplay and or google cast or whatever you know right and I think there needs to be a conversation about how we moonlight devices, about how we, you know, retire devices, because generating more e-waste is just not, I don't want to be part of that. Yeah. And 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 this is the ultimate way to generate more e-waste is by breaking devices, right? Because if you have a couple of Sonos units, you can bet that there's several hundred other thousand Sonos units that are also yep. bricked at the same time. It's a lot of collective waste. Well, exactly. I mean, great example is when uh, when Logitech uh, took their first gen uh, uh, smart remotes offline. It was it was it was the smart remotes. Oh, I forget what they're called. Uh, the Harmony remotes. The I Harmony should, hubs. I should, I should know this. I have one. Yeah, uh, me too. I had one, <laughs> and I it's now sat in a drawer doing nothing because they retired the API. Right, and and that's the problem, right? So, I mean, how many 
because I mean, just listening on or just looking on Twitter and and just different like news sites and stuff, there's thousands of people with these, right? So you know, that's that much more crap that's now in the garbage. So, which is unfortunate. So how about um, how about self hosting some other home stuff? Um, what other? I mean, we talked about switches and such. What else? Uh, what else do you uh, self host from a home automation uh, perspective? From a home automation perspective, I think the single coolest things I've done since moving in here are probably my automated garage door openers following mm-hmm. the Dr. Z's Sonoff HV videos. Uh, the other one is the Xiaomi Roborock S5, I think. Uh, and I flashed that with Valitudo, which is a custom firmware. So my robot is running Linux. My robot vacuum is running Ubuntu, that which is awesome. Awesome. super cool. That's funny. Um, what else? I think I think that they, they, I think those are the coolest ones. I mean, yeah, being able to curl my thermostat's pretty cool too. But <laughs> Ubuntu on a on a vacuum cleaner oh, is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about non home automation? like services what about like you know do you use have you got a, a dropbox replacement or you know have you got a i know you're running plex so there's a, a streaming service replacement do you sort of go out and, and look what subscriptions you're paying for and then try and self-host them first oh boy i have quite a few i think looking through my docker compose file i've got about 35 different containers running at the moment nice some of them are duplicates you know i've got a, a few that run my invoicing software and a maria db for a database mm. stuff um invoicing software invoice ninja by the way is fantastic if you're in mm. that space go check it out we talked about self-hosted git server uh shinobi for my cameras yep. I run that out of a container yes yeah works really well uh, the speed test app uh oh this is a cool cool new one that i just added recently is something called chow down now this is a self-hosted recipes app which I mean that that's it. I mean, it hosts dude, recipes. I have I have been I have been looking for one for a while. So <laughs> I'm literally going to Google this right now. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's it's uh, it's quite beautiful, you know. And a lot of these self hosted apps, sometimes the interface doesn't always live up to quite what you want. Mm, sure. Mm. Uh, no offense, but MB and Jellyfin don't quite match up to Plex. I'm sure they will. Yeah. And I'm really happy that both of those projects exist. And I think we should all get behind them and try and help them you know I'm a, i've been an mb premium whatever it is for a while to try and support that project and okay i just checked out jellyfin this week it's it's pretty good it's i mean it's come a long way since i last tried it out so yeah yeah um listening to some of the stuff that the plex ceo said at uh, ces in a couple of interviews i heard i'm just worried they just don't quite get it man like yeah i i, I, I missed that what what was the uh well we had elan on self-hosted uh, I forget which episode it was, but we had Elan, who is the CTO of yep. Plex, and he gave us an interview about a few different things. And um, go listen to that if you want to check that out. But the CEO was a different guy whose name uh, escapes me right now. But it ultimately, when they're asked questions about are you focused on the core product, the answer is always straight away yes. It's never well, yeah, we've tried this that and the other and failed a little bit in here and there's never any concession that focusing on adding all of these features that we don't want like right. podcasts like mm-hmm. title like this yes yes <clears throat> web shows. on demand thing that came recently there's never any admission that adding all this all this extra bloat is taking away from the core development time of what they've admitted is a small team and ultimately, I just want Plex to be the best in class media streamer across all my devices because they're already on all my devices. Mm-hmm. You download any, you go to any app store on any device, any TV, anything, and there's a Plex app on there. It's it, it's amazing how they've done that. And uh, I just I'm just worried about the future direction of that product. So I really hope something happens to turn it around and they kind of see that the core user base doesn't want it. And if you go to the Plex subreddit, I mean, it's a dumpster fire of people. <laughs> Every time yep. they mention a new a new blog post, it's oh, Plex is on fire, the world's going to end, blah blah. Yeah, it's yeah, not. Yeah. I mean, in reality, Plex is still very good at what it does. Yeah, but there are a few core things that I just wish it did better. Like the Android TV client is really buggy, has been for years, mm. and I wish they had audiobook support, which was a, one of the things about Premium Pass is that you're supposed to be able to vote for features. 
I've voted on dozens yeah. of things and none of them have ever come up, you know. Um, and equally, there's never been any kind of, well, we're not going to implement this because of XYZ. It's always just radio silence, which. Yeah, no. It's like talking to a back wall. to the community. Yeah, right. exactly. Didn't mean this to be a Plex rant, but it kind of turned into <laughs> one, didn't it? No, that's okay. I mean, I do want to make it absolutely clear. I think Plex is fantastic. I use it every day. But the reason I get so passionate about it is because I love it so much. Right. That's right. Like, yeah. It's it's not that I'm grabbing a pitchfork. I just want them to do better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's fair. I mean, uh, it's again as a user of something like that. I, I think it's it's fair that you're you got that opinion, right? So uh, okay, going back to my list of self-hosted apps, I think another cool one that I have is Netboot dot xyz. Now, this was actually just came out from the Linux server team, and this is a. Are you familiar with Pixie booting? Yep. It's a way to boot a Linux ISO or any other ISO actually from a Docker container. So I can now with my ESXi box hypervisor in the basement, I can now spin up a VM for pretty much any flavor of Linux in five minutes or less. I don't wow. have to download the ISO. It just comes That's up as like awesome. a, in like grub screen. Basically it's, it's not quite, but it's similar. Yeah like a pre-boot kind of selection menu and you just choose the ISO you want to boot from. So so it actually comes with the ISOs built in. No, it downloads them in real time. Oh, sorry. It it oh, it pulls Oh, that's sweet. Okay. And it has a web interface built in and you can actually pre-seed and preload images in there. So if you have a Windows ISO for example, it can't download that for you. Right. You could insert that into the Docker. Using like a volume mount or something. And then boot from that. And it works really, really well. Oh, that's awesome. I gotta I gotta check that one out. So hey, this is great this is great for me personally. This, <laughs> this <laughs> I've gotten like four things that I need to check out. So So what about like a Dropbox or a file hosting? Do you have anything for to replace that? Like that's something that I've been looking forward to getting rid of. Well I think the obvious answer in this space is probably Nextcloud. Although mm. I will say Nextcloud with a massive asterisk next to it in that their sync client can be a little bit finicky sometimes. Jupyter Broadcasting use Nextcloud extensively to sync audio files between hosts. So when we record a podcast, you know, there's Joe in London, there's Chris in Seattle, there's me in North Carolina and several other hosts all over the world. And they upload the files to a Nextcloud running on a droplet in New York because that's geographically in the middle of everybody, mm. roughly. Sure. Makes sense. Um, and it, it took the ping times for everybody down from several hundred milliseconds in Europe to everybody gets generally 50 to 100 milliseconds. That's not bad. And that's a nice advantage, actually, of self-hosting that we haven't really touched on is you because you are in complete control, you can do stuff like that. Right. If Dropbox turns into a slow monster one day, you just got to put up with it. If they decide mm. they're going to host out of Asia for some reason, which is great for you, Phil, probably, but... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but for the rest of us, it's a bit of a pain. One of the things that self-hosting enables is the ability to just pick a service up and move it to a different server on the other side of the planet with little to no effort. So to fix the syncing side of things, I have used extensively for years and years now BitTorrent Sync, which has actually now been yeah. rebranded as Resilio Sync. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uses the BitTorrent protocol, so it's pretty battle-hardened, well-tested. Mm. Yeah. Um, some ISPs will throttle that traffic because they think you're torrenting. Yeah. But it's perfectly legal to do because it's my files going to my mm. server on the other side of the planet. You know, I synced probably six terabytes from the UK to the US when I immigrated that way. So it's very reliable. It, that's interesting because I, uh, yeah, I, I ran, so I actually played with it. So I, I don't know if they still have it, but QNAP actually used to have a, have it built in. So I got a QNAP NAS at my place and I got one at my parents' place. So just to do uh, basically uh, high availability on the, on the NAS in case their, theirs dies or mine dies just to do a, do a sync. But I found that it was actually pretty slow. Um, and, and that's probably because of my ISP throttling, but uh, like, like it was pretty bad. Sometimes it can be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You will find that whilst it's indexing the files, it can, t it can be quite slow. So that if there's a lot of small files, yeah. That can make it go a bit more slowly. Um, but a good backup in that case is sync thing. That's another option in the syncing space, which yes. is quite highly regarded. And it's fully open source, which Resilio Sync I don't think is anymore. Right. So I got a good one for you. How about 
that same thing, but with versioning. But with what? Versioning. Um, so like file. So let's say History. I have a, yeah, like let's say I have a word file that I, okay, great, updated. And then version two, version three, version four. Doesn't Nextcloud support versioning? Does it? I don't know. I think yeah. it might. Interesting. The other option okay. is um, I use, this is not quite an answer to your question, but it's what I use to back up all of my files on a daily basis. And it's called Duplicati. Yeah. So this thing does file-based syncing. And the reason that f I use file-based rather than block-based is because I'm not running ZFS. If I was running ZFS, I would use ZFS send, and then that would only transfer the blocks that have changed, and that would be magic. Yeah. But unfortunately, I'm using uh, Duplicati because it works with Google Drive. Now, I'm using, a, it's a bit of a hack, it's a bit of a workaround um, from the Data Hoarder subreddit which if you're not familiar with, you should go and, you should go and become familiar with it because it's pretty yep. cool. Yeah, there's um, a lot of people with way more data than I thought oh, people need. I know, <laughs> right. Suddenly 100 terabytes, you feel in, insignificant. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the hacks that these guys kind of taught me is if you sign up for a G Suite account, which is a Google mm -hmm. domain, Google Apps account for your private domain. So I have one for my personal domain. I think it's $12 a month or something. Officially, if you have, I think it's five users or less, you're limited to one terabyte per user of cloud storage. However, right. it's not actually enforced. If you have uh, six users and above or five users and above, I think it's unlimited storage right. for every user. Um, however, I've successfully stored now for two, three years, at least two, two or three terabytes. Wow. Um, using Duplicati and another tool called Rclone, which allows yeah. me to transparently mount that Google Drive as a Fuse file system on any Linux or Mac OS or Windows box. Just works. It's amazing. That's awesome. That is actually very cool. So coming back to, you know, we started at the top of the episode, you know, a lot of people will start off with things because of cost and all that. In If you were to take away just out the cost of running your big enterprise server in your basement, that you said cost heaps of money, do you think that self-hosting ultimately with all these services that you're now replacing is saving you money in the long term or is it costing you money? Cause for example, you'd have to pay for digital ocean and, and all that hosting. And is there a price to that freedom? What an annoying question, because I'm going to have <laughs> to say, I think the answer is it probably costs me more in the long run mm. because yeah. I am never quite happy with, with how it is. I always want to improve it or make it better. And I mean, you could argue that it's a hobby that's led to my current line of employment and without that outlet to learn in a safe environment, I wouldn't have the job I do now. I wouldn't have podcasts or anything sure. like that. So mm. I would say in my case that self-hosting has led to a very fruitful career and everything else. And I wouldn't go back to not self-hosting. In fact, when I emigrated last year, oh no, I guess it would be the two, well, 18 months ago, 2018. <laughs> yeah. September 2018, when I emigrated from the UK to the US, I arrived with two suitcases and a backpack. And within two or three days, I was like, okay, I, I don't have anything on my LAN. I don't like this. <laughs> I have Wi-Fi. I have to stream everything from the internet. Are you right? right no, right. no, I, was, I don't like that. I like the idea that even though it doesn't happen very often, I like the idea that no matter what happens, I will always have my friend's box set. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. On my server downstairs that I ripped from DVDs years ago. You know, and uh, no matter what happens, I'll always have the one where Joey ate some pasta. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so so, but and 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 I mean, there, there's to to your earlier point too. I think I think there's also it's worth noting that there's also a cost to owning your own data, right? Rather than like you said, giving it up to whoever, whatever, whether it's a Google or, or whoever that service provider ends up being for whatever service right and they scrape and mine your data and you know that kind of thing too there is yep and for me i looked at it like an investment in myself as much as saving coin from cloud hosting providers right and originally when i started get, getting into this stuff you know the snowden revelations hadn't come out and you know it was probably around the time of like the nexus 5 just to put it in context of when i started getting in, interested in this stuff yeah so it was a while ago and you know, we were all young and naive and ignorance was bliss. And we didn't mm. really know that the NSA were intercepting Cisco switches and planting chips in them when they were shipping 
Sure. So they could backdoor them and who knows what else they've been up to, you know. Um, I think the Snowden revelations were really only the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And it, it didn't really start out as a privacy kind of advocation. I didn't really didn't really worry about that. It was more about just doing it because I could and I found it interesting. Yeah. And but as time's gone on, I found myself becoming genuinely concerned about my Gmail inbox and just how much of a portal into my life Google have. Yeah. You know, we were we this was really scary. We were driving down the road the other day and there was a we came up to a set of traffic lights. I was sat with a buddy of mine, not even my wife. I sat with a buddy of mine and he my phone was in my pocket off well standby locked like in my pocket just as it normally would be when i'm driving not connected to the the car is what i'm trying to say and he said geez that guy on the motorbike lane splitting is really dangerous that was it that was just one sentence that was it that was Mm -hmm. i didn't comment on it further he didn't he just said that one sentence two hours later I got an advert on Facebook about motorcycle lane splitting being dangerous. Wow. <laughs> I mean, yeah. 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 that's just yeah. not good, is it? Yeah. No, I, and, and again, we're, we're seeing tons more projects and stuff because of stuff like that, right? Just, you know, how do I utilize, I mean, we, we saw Snips.ai, which now I guess RIP, but, mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah. that, that, that was a great example of, because a lot of people are worried about uh, their Amazon Echo or Google Home or whatever, listening into your conversations at home and and what have you, and 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 again, fully admittedly, I have both of those platforms at home, right? But Same. um, but you know, there is some value in worrying about your privacy for to sell it to an Amazon or a Google or whoever. I think there'll come a point in the future, maybe as I'm formulating this thought, I'm kind of talking myself out of it, but here it is anyway. I think there'll come some point in the future where mainstream people become sufficiently concerned about mass data collection yeah. that they may well all want to do some kind of offline self-hosting thing. Mm. I mean, Apple's kind of started that with their whole privacy mantra, which yeah. I know is a load of nonsense, but their privacy mantra about, you know, data never leaves the phone all that kind of stuff um, yeah, yeah even though there were apple employees listening into siri recordings at the same time yeah. i mean come on <laughs> and also the european yeah. union with gdpr and, and recently the new californian privacy laws have come out yeah. yeah there are steps being taken and i think things have to get worse before they get better hmm. uh, in the in a space as lucrative and as unregulated as this we've got to expect some pretty nasty behavior yeah unfortunately i mean why, why should we expect it? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just one of those things in the modern world that we unfortunately have to put up with. And, uh, I suspect there'll come a point, a tipping point where something, I mean, you would think this, I keep saying it, but the Snowden revelations would be enough, but apparently not. There'll be something where, and here, here's a great example, like where, where drones that I saw a, I saw an article yesterday where a woman was complaining that a drone followed, followed her for eight miles, two days in a row. And she was really worried about the invasion of her privacy. Right. Um, because in the state of New Hampshire, they don't have a right to reasonable expectation of privacy law. She wanted to file a federal case that this guy was invading her her right to privacy. Mm. To which I sort of thought to myself, hmm, I bet she had a cell phone in her pocket. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's right. And it's it's better yeah. the devil you know. Like If you can see a drone in the sky, you can be like, oh, yeah, that's spying on me. That's... I mean, it's probably just yeah. some some dude, middle aged dude like me, who's sat in a car going, "Oh, this is cool. Look, I can follow this car with my drone." Isn't this fun? <laughs> <laughs> Whereas in reality, the real kind of data that's being collected, the real kind of surveillance that's happening, is much more egregious, and it's happening in your pocket without you even realizing it. And if that's not a good motivation to self-host, this has <laughs> turned into a bit of a rant. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, people. <laughs> I just feel strongly about this stuff, you know. No, which is, no, which is great. I mean, and, and and I think I think that's a you know a, a good uh, that's a big reason why I think we wanted to have you on and chat about this as well. Is again, as Home Assistant itself is primarily a self hosted product, right? And 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 I mean, in our lens, I think sometimes people don't know why to do it or. You know, why do I want to take the burden of dealing with this myself outside of the software piece? Like, why do I actually have to deal with 
hey, I need a Raspberry Pi, I got to put it on a Raspberry Pi or a Docker container or, a, you know, whatever it is, right? So I think I think that was a big motivation for why we wanted to have this conversation. And yeah, we talked about other stuff as well. But but I think, you know, it still kind of ties back to some of the reasoning behind self-hosting Home Assistant and, and, and again, other services. I mean, we talked about NextCloud and such as well, right? So personally, I thought that was a great discussion. So yeah, thank you so much, Alex, for coming on and talking area off about self-hosting it's awesome you're very welcome it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both and uh i really hope that the listeners got something out of it in between the rants <laughs> <laughs> all right perfect thanks a lot alex and uh hopefully we'll uh, chat with you soon i hope so yeah and uh, we should probably have you guys on the self-hosted show at some point yeah we'll talk to you off about home assistant for sure If you want to share your home assistant journey or come on as a guest, reach out to us at feedback at haspodcast.io. That's H-A-S-S podcast.io. The Home Assistant Podcast is hosted by Phil Hawthorne and myself, Rohan Karamandi. For links to topics that we discussed today, check out our show notes on haspodcast.io.